Hello, welcome to the show. I'm Melissa Ridgen. It's not news that Indigenous people are overrepresented in the criminal justice system. While incarceration rates are declining on the whole, statistics show that Indigenous adults serving time is actually on the rise. We account for about 28% of adults in jail, while we actually make up just 4% of the adult population in Canada. That 28% has been a steady increase from uh, 21% in 2006. And when you break it down by gender, it's even worse for Indigenous women. We make up 43% of the population behind bars. And our youth, 46%. Why are we so overrepresented as criminals and as victims of crime? Uh, why are we serving so much time? And why are so many of us trapped in this system? Today, we are putting crime and justice reform in focus. Join our conversation, and that includes you folks listening to us on Element FM Radio in Toronto and Ottawa. Our phone lines are open. You can call us toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. You can also tweet us at InFocus. Before I introduce you to our guests, I want to take a look at an episode of uh, APT Investigates from 2017. Reporter Cullen Crozier examined the problem we're discussing today in his story called Crime and Injustice. Let's listen. The overrepresentation of Indigenous people in Canada's justice system has reached a state of crisis. While Indigenous people make up just under 5% of the Canadian population, they now account for over 27% of all inmates incarcerated. Indigenous men and women carry a lot of disadvantage with them, and they carry a lot of disadvantage that flows directly from colonial contact. Um, so intergenerational trauma, the lingering effects of, of, of residential schools, of the 60s scoop, of, of other policies around assimilation, the destruction of culture and language, breaking up families, um, these have lasting impacts. These systems and structures were not set up to achieve justice for Indigenous peoples. These systems and structures were set up to control, manage, assimilate, eliminate. There is racism within the justice system, there's no doubt about that. I think we see racism in the police forces. We see uh, unconscious racism within the laws of this country. We haven't changed the procedures in the criminal code or the criminal laws of this country in any significant way for uh, 100 years or more. The relationship between Indigenous people and the Canadian criminal justice system is broken. Over the last decade, the federal inmate population grew by just under 10%, while over that same period, the Indigenous inmate population has soared by more than 50%. Indigenous people are now the fastest growing prison population in the country. Joining us now is Ernie Ludet. He is a best-selling author, a public speaker, and a retired police officer, one of the first that was hired by the Saskatoon Police. He was known as Indian Ernie on the Streets. He's written three books about his time as a police officer and the role that the criminal justice system plays in our lives. I want to know, first of all, how do, it's not uh, overly common for a lot of young Indigenous boys to dream of being a police, police officer. How did you end up with that career? Well, I always knew I wanted to be a soldier. That was, uh, and then when I was 17, I, uh, I joined the Canadian Forces, and I uh, served five years in the infantry with uh, Princess Patricia's, uh, uh, who were based right here in Winnipeg. Uh, and then uh, my unit was getting posted to Germany, and I knew if I stayed in the infantry, I would be a lifer if I went to Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, so I changed trades to the military police, and that's where the interest in justice and policing came from. Did you have, um, as a boy growing up, you grew up in, uh, what was the, the community you're from in? It's Con called Oba. Okay, yeah. so yeah. did you have a lot of interaction with police growing up as a, as a young kid? No, very rarely. Uh, they came when something serious happened, uh, like the one time a bootlegger shot a customer when he didn't feel like selling <laughs> it. And then another time when uh, one of the trappers had died, uh, drowned, and his body came up, and then the police hmm. came. But other from that, and then the CN police. Actually, the CN police were probably the most prominent police that, that I knew, but they, they were there just to prevent theft from yeah. derailments and stuff like that. And, and that's, that's different than a lot of young Indigenous kids in urban centres and their involvement is in seeing police in their communities, right. certainly. So you didn't have a, that negative connotation of what police officers were. Until I went to high school. 
So you went to interesting. Yeah, because yeah, I had to board away for high school, and then when I got to to a town that was uh, about 50 miles north of, of Oba, uh, you know, I was one of the only uh, indigenous kids in, in town, mm -hmm. and uh, the police used to slow down and, and give you the stare, but I never reacted to it. I didn't give them the finger or tell them to take off, but it, and and, and uh, eventually they just got tired of looking at me. Yeah. And then uh, my first real interactions came once I was in the military and then with the military police, and uh, and it it seemed like something I wanted to do, and and, and uh, that's what led me to Saskatoon. To Saskatoon, yeah. and so explain to us. So your what was your experience? You you joined the Saskatoon Police Service. Um, as an Indigenous man with Indigenous, indigenous life ex, uh, experience, you get there and you're on the streets and s how do you see, uh, how does your life at that point uh, gel with what you're seeing on the streets and your role as a, as a police officer? Well, uh, when, I, uh, when I was in the Army, it was, uh, everything was merit-based and being in a Native or a First Nations person, uh, it was actually an advantage. People thought you could see in the dark. You never got lost. You never got hungry. And and uh, so when I got to the, the police, to Saskatoon Police, uh, I came to an organization and that uh, was really at the at the uh, the moment of change. It was women were coming into policing. Visible minorities were coming into policing, and uh, there was a, a certain segment of of the police population. I imagine all of Canada, but in Saskatoon, that weren't ready, for, well, that, that wasn't in any uh, shape or form ready for, to work with, with uh, minorities, women, mm. uh, First Nations people. So there's a lot of butting heads, and, uh, and you know, and, uh, I was in Saskatoon for about a year, and I actually uh, th thought about going back to the military, because I thought, what did I, what did <laughs> I do? Because Saskatchewan, uh, back then was a have-not province and the yeah. po poverty and the issues. This would have been in... 87. 87, okay. Yeah, which isn't that long ago, except for the kids for, that are listening and they'll go, oh, 100 <laughs> years ago. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was a challenge and there was a lot of challenges and and, uh, uh, and I got kind of thrown into that role. When they hired me, I was immediately in the newspaper with myself and a, and a Métis fellow from Mill Lacrosse. Crosse. And, and basically, Saskatoon Police Service said, look, we're, we're changing. We're yeah. bringing Indigenous people in. And uh, a lot of the old cops says, don't do that. You'll never be able to work undercover and all that stuff like that. But to me, it was just, uh, you know, like a soldier, you just do what, you, do what you're told. And, right. And uh, I didn't realize th how much, how everybody had expectations for me as, a, as an individual officer. And so, so you mean people within the force too? Or did you find that people on the streets had expectations People in the streets, you yeah. Uh, you know, some people immediately dismissed me as an apple, as a person that was working for the white man in the system. Right. Uh, other people said we got high expectations of you. A lot of the elders used to tell me that. Uh, some of the police, the more progressive minor police, had uh, high expectations of me. And, and uh, some of the other police uh, couldn't wait for me to crash and burn. Oh, of course. Yeah. So it was uh, it was pr it was a pretty conflicted uh, few years, and then of course we ran into uh, uh, I, I, sorry I ran into a, a lot of investigations that were closed, and reopened them as a constable, which caused me no end to grief with the detectives, uh, because I I I'd get a call from someone in the community that I built a relationship with, and I said, you know what's happening with my file, and I'd pull the file out and I'd read it. And it said unable to contact complaint and file closed. Ah. And and I thought like what, what effort did you make? Did you go to the house? Did you call? And uh, basically they just looked at the name, the surname, and shut it down. And so when I reopened the case and actually laid charges or whatever, whatever, however it was resolved, then I had to deal with that detective after. And and uh, yeah, who probably made, wasn't overly happy with you going over his work and reopening the files, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. So did, what type? Of, I wanted to ask you that too. Did, did you see um, on the ground a difference between how Indigenous victims or perpetrators of crime were treated differently than uh, Indigenous uh, non... No, let me rephrase that. D is there a difference between whether you are a non-Indigenous criminal or suspect and how you're treated versus if you are a non-Indigenous or an Indigenous victim of crime? Did you see that there's different ways that it shakes down the system depending on whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous, regardless yeah. of whether you're on the perpetrator side or the victim side? Back then, yeah. Okay. It definitely was. But uh, and th and this th 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 is one of the things that, that I think uh, I saw change the most uh, over the course of my career is uh, when people knew I was involved, like even the other police officers and that, knew I was involved, they would actually put the effort in to do it because they didn't want me reopening their case or embarrassing them or whatever the case was. Yeah. And, I, and I took on like some uh, issues that nobody wanted, that uh, solvent abuse, 
uh, uh, denatured alcohol, like uh, Chinese cooking wine mm -hmm. and all those things, and you know, and uh, basically fought upstream and was told, you know, don't do this, you're wasting your time, blah, blah, blah. And then I would do it, and after you did it, you set that example. Right. Yeah, and and then all of a sudden, yes, this is something, especially with the younger cops, saying, "Okay, Ernie did that. Well, let's try this." And so when, when I dealt with the solvent abuse, because in Saskatoon at the time, there was about 150 kids that were abusing solvents, but it ultimately yeah. it was three adults that were providing it all the time. And mm -hmm. uh, and eventually, I found a, a obscure law in the criminal code and applied it to him. And and uh, and then after that, we we actually uh, solved that problem. And the other officers following behind me did the same thing with the other mm -hmm. two adults that were uh, stuff. So I believe you know, as an individual you can, you can affect change. Uh, I, my biggest belief in the system, of uh, our justice system, and there's two, really two justice systems. One's the grinder, where 90% of all stuff gets solved. First appearances at court, guilty pleas, uh, negotiations on sentences and stuff, and and that's, uh, it's just pitless, it never stops. Right. You know, every, every morning docket court is full. Then you have the trial courts, and, and that's where we've had the most controversy in some of the big, high-profile trials. Uh, as a police officer, and, and uh, sometimes I, uh, you know, I, I would look and I, I think I've got a slam-dunk case, like a, in a murder case, where you, the fir you were the first patrol officer, even though you weren't the homicide investigator, and you got them with blood, you got motives, you got, you got them. Yeah. Right? And they go to, it goes to trial, and, and uh, they get two years, three years, and five years for manslaughter. For for what's was a deliberate, and you know in my experience a deliberate murder at the very least a second degree, and then we see that happen here in Winnipeg, mm -hmm. we see what happened in North Battleford, yeah, in, uh, you know, and uh, and I understand the family's frustration and pain, and I uh, and as an Indigenous man and indig how Indigenous people will feel that the system was against them, yeah. but there's no guaranteed outcome in those kind of trials, and, and it's all about good work, and the, and that good work comes by. by bringing in the right people have, but have the right empathy yeah. to the people that are involved in that. So uh, I, um, I'm going fast here, but <laughs> basically I, I, uh, I'd like to, what I like, or what I'm seeing and what I like seeing is the more Indigenous people in, engaged in, in the, the process of yeah. law, uh, the better we'll get. Well, the better we'll get. But and, on the one, and just that there's I have one caveat though, is that you know, we have a high incarceration rate that's gone up a lot in the past yeah. few years. Yeah. Uh, I think if you look at uh, some of that population, it's directly related to gangs and drugs. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, uh, the, unfortunately, uh, a large influx of the federal prison population is gang members and drugs. I mean, yeah. we, uh, I just read a story about a fellow here in Winnipeg that went, uh, was just arrested for and convicted of his third murder. His third murder. We had that in Saskatchewan too as well. And it was all gang related. Indian yeah. Posse, uh, all those the, you know, high, high profile gangs. <coughs> so if you take those, those criminal organizations out of the, the equation, uh, a lot of the federal prisoners that are going now are the result of, uh, uh, indigenous people that are federal prisoners, are the result of a long history and litany of, of uh, of uh, rape from residential schools to the scoop to all that, and and unfortunately, which starts as a minor criminal record keeps going up until eventually uh, it becomes federal sentence where the, the the system doesn't know how else to deal with you, right? Yeah, we've got so when we uh, were doing our social media advancing this show, there was we did have some people who had a lot a lot to say when we talk about justice reform and over representation of Indigenous people in the system. Um, we actually have uh, somebody on the line here who had, um, who had sent us a message, or commented, I guess, on our social media. His name is Damon, and I want to raise this point that he makes because th this is echoed by a lot of people. Uh, so Damon says, people have to be held accountable for their actions. Why is it that so many First Nations activists openly support law-breaking people? We all are bound by the same laws. It's not colonial, it's equality. And it's time you get used to it. You are responsible for every choice that you make, not the government, not your family, not some other race, you. Damon continues that the cycle of crime will break when there is a greater emphasis on being placed, or a greater emphasis being placed on personal responsibility by First Nations leaders. Lots can be done if people are actually willing to take account for their choices, act accordingly, and actively work to improve their communities and relations with those in their neighboring communities. So we actually have, we have Damon on the line now. He's, this is, Damon, welcome. Are you there, Damon? Oh, 
We got him, but it's uh, a slow phone system today. Mm, hey, you. David. Sorry. Uh, yes, thank you for uh, having me on today. Yeah, thanks um, so much. I, you read, I just read uh, the comment that you made on our social media. This is, uh, you're not an Indigenous person. No, no, no I'm not. I, I just um, want to say that we do hear a lot of that same thing, even from within Indigenous communities. We need to stop saying, like, leaders need to start, start uh, uh, leading, and, and this, we're all responsible, responsible for ourselves, and it's our decision to get out of the cycle of crime, etc. So your, your comment, uh, maybe a lot, a lot of people would say it out loud, but a lot of people certainly think it. And I thank you for sharing it with us and then joining us. Um, is there something that you, you know, you, when you, what, what made you want to even engage in this conversation? Um, it's, uh, you know, it's something that I've, I've spent the last, I've spent quite a, quite a few of the last few months here really, really thinking of it and not, you know, not just like, spend five minutes thinking of it and then go on like I would I used to work outside and by myself so I would spend hours like really thinking about these things and trying to figure out what all are the contributing factors that would lead to a high such a high incarceration rate and, and what do you think those factors are like you don't well, just think, think that indigenous people are predisposed to being committing crimes or being victims of crimes you you spent time thinking about what some of those contributing factors would be that lead up to this I think I think the best way, like, I think the best way to look at it is there's sort of a, there's a four, four different levels that you can look at it. You can look at it at the individual level, the community level, the provincial level, and the federal level. So at the federal level, I think there's, there's some laws and regulations that are in place that make it a bit more difficult, that make it too difficult to really sort of develop the, uh, reserve communities into really strong, thriving communities. And the, the communities that I've been on, I'm not too sure how a lot of them are, but the ones that I've been on, there have been ones where it's like you go there and there's a grocery store and a school and a gas station, and then an hour, for an hour around you, there's forest. And as a youth in that community, like, there's no, there's no reason to be out in the community to, to go out and do anything anything positive there's no opportunity and so part of the community approach is strengthening the community itself bringing in more opportunity um and and one of the uh, like one of the ideas i was thinking about was was uh you know sort of trying trying to build local micro economies with neighboring communities mm -hmm. using indigenous ideas and indigenous products so for example like maybe a group of families gets together and they start making um you know ready to go meals using traditional recipes and tradition traditional meals and then they make a deal with a bunch of the grocery stores in the surrounding areas to sell that product mm -hmm. and so now you have something where there's people in the community they can they can go they, they can be a part of that mm -hmm. they're doing something that's that's increasing and spreading their culture and rejuvenating their culture and it's it, you know it's meaningful and it's something to to distract you from what could lead to you committing crimes. And then at the provincial level, I think there's there's also a lot a lack of funding in terms of in terms of things like proper proper infrastructure, proper um, proper resources for for like say health services, and that would include uh, therapy services, addictions counseling. Family mm -hmm. services, I think family services is one that would be a really big help because if you want to stop people from from choosing lives of crimes, one of the best things you can do right. is strengthen the family unit. And then after that, the next best thing you, you can do is strengthen the community because yeah. the more family units you strengthen, the easier it is to strengthen that community. So, and we're going to, we, I have to so take a break, have, but when we know, come back, that's exactly what I want to get into that. Family reunification. So, lodges is one idea that one of my friends brought up. Where thanks, where David. We have, have to take a quick break. We are going to get into some of that when we come back, though, about the you know the, what we could do as families and as individuals and then as communities. So we are going to get into that. When we come back, um, Indigenous leaders in northwestern Ontario are working to break the cycle of over-representation of people in the criminal justice system. We talked to one leader about how they're planning to do that. And hello to our listeners on Elements Radio in Toronto at 106.5 FM and in Ottawa at 95.7. Everybody stay with us. Now, you can call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. 
Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus and send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Welcome back. Let's go to social media now to hear some of what you're saying about today's topic. We asked, what can we do to stop the cycle of crime among our people? Ivy says, healing begins at home, start there, so many unhealthy and toxic parents exist. Uh, sexual abuse, mental abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse, and spiritual abuse still are very much exist, uh, especially in remote communities. Talking circles with an actual healthy-minded, decent, accepting, and non-gossiping leader, I believe, would be ideal. Elmore says, we need to instill a sense of pride that our ancestors held back into our youth. Show them that it's uplifting to walk the red road. Teach our young men that it's okay to show emotion, to be vulnerable. Show our women that real, what real strength means. Teach them that the Creator gave us women many gifts, and we are to be proud of that. NJ says that we have accepted the colonial mentality. Bad people make bad choices, and bad people go to prison or get, and get rehabilitated to become contributing members of society. We need to break this colonial way of thinking because it's just increasing statistics. People aren't bad, they're hurt. Sandy says, well, first off, get rid of the drugs and alcohol, and then the healing journey will begin. Offer support groups, programs for victims, all kinds uh, of all kinds of abuse, positive parenting programs. We need open family resource centers. Start teaching each other how to live in peace and prosperity without negativity. And Bill says, education, learning how to integrate your culture into the modern life and thrive. If you'd like to add your opinion to our topic of conversation, here's how you can do that. Join our conversation now. You can call in toll-free at 1-877-647-2786. Like and watch us live on the APTN News Facebook page. Follow and tweet us at APTN in Focus. And send your thoughts in an email to infocus at aptn.ca. Grand Council Treaty 3 in Northwestern Ontario hosted a two-day workshop last week with a focus on reducing the number of First Nations people in the criminal justice system. Grand Chief Francis Cavanaugh says the system has to be reformed, it's obviously not working for Indigenous people, and it keeps them trapped in a cycle that they can't easily get out of. Federal Minister of Border Security and Organized Crime Reduction, Bill Blair, he attended that workshop, as did numerous Ontario justice officials. Grand Chief Cavanaugh joins us now. Thank you for coming in to chat about this very important topic. You're welcome. So I want to know, where do you even begin? I mean, how do you have a two-day workshop to even begin discussing the topic of us being overrepresented in the criminal justice system? I guess uh, to begin with, uh, we have uh, an indigenous justice group within the, uh, within the provincial government of Ontario. Mm -hmm. It's a part of a... It's an advisory group to the Attorney General's office. How long has that been going on for? It has been going on till since uh, 2016. But, well, it's new. but initially, there was a there was some consultation with uh, with respect to what's what's happening right now with respect to overrepresentation. Mm -hmm. So that's where it came about. That's where that's where this group was formed. Now, now we're in a position to be able to advise the Attorney General's office in terms of how you deal with over-representation. Over mm -hmm. Just like uh, you talked about, I uh, watched a segment earlier about uh, over-representation in, in Canada. But in Ontario, you know, there is over-representation in the whole province of Ontario. Mm -hmm. But in, the, in where I come from, Kenora, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, the situation is acute. Well, I was a, I was a, when I came out of journalism yeah. school, that was my first job, was yeah. at the Kenora Daily mm -hmm. Minor News, and yeah. I was a court reporter there for five mm -hmm. years. Yeah. I know of which you speak. It's, yeah. you know, it's, there's the over-representation is across Canada, yeah. but it's particularly acute in your, in your yes. area, in Treaty 3. Just uh, for example, uh, 90, 94%, this was uh, from two years ago when the commissioner from Human Rights visited Canada and visited Kenora mm -hmm. and the jail itself. 94% of the prison population was First Nations, mm -hmm. and 80% of that 94% were only on remand. They're, they hadn't even been convicted of a crime or anything, but they're being mm -hmm. held there. Yeah. 
And mm -hmm. what is the, so w the, this Justice Committee and Treaty 3, w that is a big part of the problem is the, if you're arrested for something, you're instantly just tossed in, into remand, into custody to await your trial or, or whatever. How do, you, how do you fix that? How do we fix that? I guess uh, right uh, yesterday, there was an announcement uh, from uh, the province where Kenora is getting a community justice center that is going to deal with uh, those kind of uh, people that are inmates right now on remand. Okay. Because right now what's happening is a lot of these, uh, a lot of these people that are being held you know, are incarcerated because they have, uh, when they let them go, They'll just they, reoffend, or they'll they, breach a condition. They'll or breach their conditions, and they, it's just a re revolving door syndrome kind of thing. Yeah. They go back in there after a few days, and like I said, 94%. And when you look at the, <clears throat> the staff of the jail itself, I believe they said there's about 120 positions there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Last time I heard, there was only one Native person that worked in that facility. And they have no culturally appropriate programming. They're not allowed to sweat or do, do mm. things that are, you know, about, about us. It's right. not there. And on top of that, you know, when they hold these people in there, there's, a, there's a gang cultures in there. So they're two competing gangs. And then when they're finally let out, that's the culture that they take back home. You know, so that's... That's I mean, a this, big issue. it's just insane to me for me to get my head around where, how, where do you even begin to stop this? It's so multi-layered and complex that you, is it a little frustrating for you to even look at where to start fixing? It is uh, frustrating for me as a leader, but uh, I do see hope in that uh, community justice center because it's not going to be about. Uh, an adversarial sort of sort of positioning. It's going to be about creating balance between the offender and uh, and uh, the victim. On top of that, the offender is going to get uh, training th through that center. It's not going to be punitive, where you know. So what we hope to, what we hope to do is, is train these people so they can successfully reintegrate into their community and become. Where it is, I, I don't think I'm understanding how the center works. So is this, when, if you've been charged with a crime, then you go the route of this system, or the, or the center, sorry, or is instead of going to remand, or is this something that you would go into this stream if you were sentenced? Or, Both. Okay. If you are sentenced, or if, if you chose to go that route, you know, some, something like a restorative justice program. We do have a... We do have those in our in our area. Treaty Three has a justice program that uh, that there are options for people that offend <clears throat> to go before the restorative justice uh, circles rather than going to the court system. Is it just not working, or <clears throat> is it overloaded? Because I mean, we still have I, the, prop the the problem of overrepresentation I in think the jails. It's, it's only in its very infancy. I say infancy because it's only been in about two years now that they've gone into that, that, that realm of uh, dealing with uh, Do the restorative that, justice. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. How many, do you have any idea how many cases have gone through that program in the two years it's existed? I am not certain. There's several communities that have that as well as uh, town centers. Yeah. And so for this, the center that you're talking about that's going to operate in Kenora, what is there a goal with how many people uh, can be, can go through that center as opposed and as opposed to be going through the route of the district jail. Well, I guess that's uh, the dynamics that needs to be worked out right now. You know, it was just announced. It's been something that we talked about for over a year. Mm -hmm. You know, and finally it was announced that uh, when the Ontario budget was released in uh, March of uh, 2018, Kenora was chosen as one of the sites to have uh, that center. When does it open, sorry? What's that? When does it open? We don't know. It's, it's, so. It was just announced yesterday, so we have to work Oh, I'm sorry, that it was March last yeah, year that yeah, it was. Yeah. Okay, sorry, that's, I had my wires crossed. Mm -hmm. um, there was a change in government, so that's yes. why it took this long to finally announce that there is, it's still on the table. 
And are you finding that at the provincial level and at the federal level that there's buy-in from governments to want to fix this problem? There is, with the, the province, you know, there is heavy, heavy buy-in by the province, you know, I give them credit for that, you know, so. Hmm. But uh, in terms of uh, federal, I have not really, really heard anything in that regard with respect to You did have the, the minister center. that was there at this workshop. That's that was, he was actually, he was not there. Oh, I thought he no. had been in attendance. But I had met him on different occasions with respect to uh, cannabis and stuff like that. Yeah. Hmm. What would you, um, you know, have you had any opportunity to see a system that is working elsewhere that could be taken and be, and be brought to Treaty 3 and might help solve this? This overrepresentation in jails, uh, crimes, uh, overrepresentation in, in victims of crime. Even have you seen somewhere else something that's working that might be able to work at Treaty Three? New Zealand has a similar situation, and that's the model that uh, we we use to try and uh, engage with the province and bring in this type of a facility home. So, that, but I haven't uh, haven't seen, you know, there how they operate, or I've just heard about it. I've had uh, information shared with me that uh, that's what they do there. They, mm -hmm. they incorporate their culture, their traditional laws in uh, addressing the I mean, the it always, it sounds like a good idea when we think about, like, get back to traditional ways and, um, you know, find answers in our communities, in our traditions. But then you also will have, if somebody isn't given hard time for whatever crime they commit and they come out and they, re they commit another crime, then you have the outrage mm -hmm. of that, right? Is there a worry as a leader that if you're diverting from the system that we know isn't working, but if we're diverting people from that system and into a different flow, if they, if they, are, they do commit another crime, that that comes back on you and... and kind of blows the lid off their, uh, the idea that we can fix it somehow. Like, do you, have to, think, you weigh uh, the both options, I guess, I right? I think those, those have to be looked at. You know, I know I've had uh, experiencing uh, visiting our brothers and sisters south of us. I've been to Wisconsin, I've been to Michigan, and uh, I've been uh, through uh, Navajo Nation, mm. where I've watched this. and. Uh, in all cases, they have taken over justice in their areas, but what they don't have is uh, major crimes. So that discussion needs to have, you know, needs to take place. Mm -hmm. Down there, major crimes automatically go federal or, or the state. You know, major crimes meaning murder, maybe uh, sexual assault and stuff like that. So. So those discussions need to take place. I mean, I don't want to go the route of uh, having that, you know, uh, against us sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, we're going to take another break. We've got lots more still to talk about. Uh, <laughs> stick around. We're going to continue to talk about justice uh, reform and crime prevention. Welcome back. So I'm joined here by my guest Ernie and uh, Francis. They're still here from our first and second blocks. We're going to keep talking about the justice system uh, and what we can do to fix it. I want to take a look at a clip from Cullen Crozier's piece, Crime and Injustice, which we saw earlier in the show. This is Dan Parlo, who was a prison inmate. Let's listen. It's a place where despair is, for the most part, life in there, um, little hope. Uh, and, you know, being returned back to communities and so on where um, poverty is in place, you know, and, uh, or, or even in the cities, you know, in, in urban settings, right, where marginalization, systemic racism, all these things are still in place, inequalities where it, it's hard to move, you know, to rise above that. So, Ernie, you uh, retired Saskatoon police officer known as Indian Ernie on the streets. You, I mean, this, that's, he's not saying anything, uh, that clip is not saying anything that you haven't probably heard a million times. Yes. So what do you, what do we do with that? We, we hear this, we know this, but we're still in this sinking ship. Well, uh, 
But whether people realize, or realize they're not, uh, there's been a lot of changes in, in the system. Unfortunately, the incarceration rate stays high because you still have it. You're still dealing with the uh, the results of how the system used to be in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s. So th a lot of those people that are getting remanded, uh, like in Kenora's case, are is because they have built up this track record of, of, uh, of failing to appear or consuming alcohol, consuming drugs. And I was one of those police officers that enforced those things because they were a very effective means of preventing further crimes, right? It, it, so uh, you stand by that? Because I've no, heard a well, lot of yeah. people, like a lot of people will say you, you need to scrap the, uh, f uh, abstain from alcohol consumption because if that's part of the conditions and you breach that, then you're right back in, in rematch, rematch yeah. right? But you, from a frontline perspective, look and say, no, those are important to uphold those types of things because they can prevent other crimes. Yeah, a person get, getting a, a serious, serious charge rather than the first charge that they get, it's will use armed robbery. And then, uh, and, it, and unfortunately the armed robbery occurred when they were drunk or high, and mm -hmm. if they get drunk or high, then chances are they're going to do, do it again. So, so it's, it's preventative. But on the same token, and, and this one thing I learned in the military and I learned in the police, is that if you want to affect change, you have to talk economics. With the with leaders, because leaders understand economics, right? So if you want if you want to affect change and keep people out of remand, uh, you have to say there's got to be a more cost effective way of doing this. And then if you present it as a cost effective way of doing it, like like they're going to do in Kenora with the, the Justice Center, uh, where you can get people to to buy into staying out of jail, uh, and do it where that it seems like a good idea. Yeah. Just buy in to staying out of jail. It well, seems like a no-brainer, right? <laughs> but but you think of the average cost of an inmate, uh, even for a week in a provincial correctional center, as to, and take one fifth of that money. And, and Do you know that figure? I mean, I know, I fed, know federally. I want to say federally for a year of a federal inmate. I last I remember it was like hundred and fourteen thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't know it off the top of my head exactly. All I, all I know is that if you use one fifth of that money to to uh, say we'll take a and we'll use Northern Ontario as an example. Say a young fellow from outside of Kenora comes in from up north, goes to school, gets arrested, uh, and then eventually finds himself before the courts. And if you could provide a system at one quarter of the cost or one fifth of the cost of remanding him, so that he would not get in trouble again, mm -hmm. and 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 buy into it as as an individual and with with the, the help of his family or his, uh, or his First Nation. Or the uh, the local justice center, uh, it, it's not a hard sell. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's because um, a lot of the justice system, unfortunately, is is an industry, right? Yeah, a and uh, and yeah. it's been an industry for years. I uh, I was part of it. I you know I I I I, yeah. I arrested a lot of people and put them through that system. Uh, you know, and you had that feeling of justice when you did, especially when you dealt with victims. Yeah. You think, yeah, I just helped the, the victim of this crime. Yeah. But at the same token, it was like creating more victims down the road. And so uh, I think the most effective uh, kind of justice reform is to, is to make it an economic case for keeping people out of the system and, and, and uh, literally taking one-fifth of the money we spend on incarceration and remand uh, into providing outs for people and and uh, interesting I'm curious your thoughts on that I guess uh, the point about uh, economics you know for me I look I look at it from the perspective of uh, the over representation us becoming commoditized we're, we're commodities absolutely because we're there we're providing opp job opportunities for others that's why I pointed out that uh, of 114 or 120 employees, there's only one Aboriginal. That's uh, two years ago. I don't know what the number is now, but uh, so that's that's one of the problems. We're, we become commodities. We make money for others. You know, not only in the injustice system with child welfare. I say foster system and, and health, health-wise, mm -hmm. we're overrepresented in many different areas. Are you hopeful that so when this center gets up and, and going, that you, I'll ask you as a former police officer, so if you are charged with a crime and you have a bunch of um, conditions, and normally you would be going to remand to wait for your trial because history has shown you've got, you don't show up or you, you breach conditions and whatnot. Do you think that a center, is, is there anything this, that a center could do 
that would keep somebody out of remand for that, that would um, work in a, some sort of a way that you still have your community safety, but is also keeping offenders true to what their conditions are? Is there anything you can visualize how that would work? I can, I can visualize it and, uh, you know, because a, a, a lot of offenders I dealt with, uh, for the most part, when they committed their offense, were in a bad place at a bad time. Not, not all, they're like they're just true psychopaths, but they're very, very rare. Uh, and most people, if you could connect them up with something that was important to them, like family or, or their, home, their home band, or, or uh, to make them feel, because uh, make them pers personally accountable to their family, not as opposed to a system, right? And, and that's one of the things for me is I've, I've always believed that every, everybody's got a name. They're not just statistics. They have names. They, every, uh, there's, uh, every judge has a name, every lawyer, every, every person in the system. And, uh, and if we could uh, make that personal connection to get them to engage mm -hmm. with people that matter to them, they're far less likely to keep stepping into the system. But if, you're, if they're on their own and, they're, and say, like I said, they'll use the Northern Ontario example because it's, it's a perfect example. Come down from a, from a First Nation to go to school, get in trouble, get thrown into remand. And when you're in remand, you, s you might meet one of your cousins, but chances are you're going to meet a lot of people you don't know who have no uh, particular affection for you and they're in that, that gang, not gang, but that prison life where it's, yeah. you know, uh, survive. And then all we do is create that person and send them back up north. Um, I, uh, the biggest thing to me is let's let's try it. Let's try every darn thing we can. And and because uh, because First Nations communities are are smaller and more intimate, I think that that uh, uh, it could be effective if you, it as a, as a, as an experiment, if you want to call it that. Well, what uh, we have now isn't working, right? So we got yeah, so we what's wrong something. with an experiment yeah. at this point in time. Is there something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, in addition to that uh, community justice center, Kenora is also getting what they call bail beds, you know, the, where they're going to house people that are on remand or have been came out of bail. Okay. That's to address the situation where when you let somebody out on bail, they're they're so far removed from where they came from, they have no money to go, f go home, fly home or whatever, or they don't have a place to stay. Yeah. Now they have an opportunity to grab one of those bail beds and, and have themselves processed through whatever they need to be processed through. That's, so they're gonna be working in con conjunction with the center itself. Mm -hmm. Not only that, uh, Kenora has been uh, working very hard on addressing homelessness. So, so that's all coming into play and that's all uh, service providers coming together to Those try to address Those service providers that. are part of the industry that you talk about. I always yeah, love when we've yeah. got the industry <laughs> yes. that, that commodifies us, yeah. trying to find solutions to help us. And I look and go, that would make them, that would work them out of a job. It doesn't make sense. Like I question whether they're able to actually deliver on something that like that you know but that's what uh, that's what we're looking at and some of them are coming want to join us in our, in our efforts to deal with that type of stuff um, I want to go to another clip we're gonna we're running out of time I wanted to go to uh, Canada's correctional investigator he had an interesting comment in Colin Crozier's story but we're gonna skip ahead this is um, Aboriginal justice consultant Mark Marsolet uh, and he is realistic that as long as we're living in assimilated communities we can't just necessarily have our own system separate from that but maybe there's some hybrids that might serve everybody better let's take a listen we can never really fully change 100% our justice system to meet our indigenous ways, but we can definitely work alongside the Western justice system and try and, you know, still work within our communities and still move forward. So he's, I mean, he's, he should be sitting at this table because he's kind of saying the same thing that we're, we're sitting here having this discussion about. Is there, um, I mean, I'm just going to open it to you. What would you, what's, what's the takeaway for this? This isn't just specific to Northwestern Ontario. Everywhere in Canada, what should we be thinking about in terms of, I guess, not maybe even fixing this system, but finding a system, creating a system that will work for us uh, in terms of preventing crime and getting us out of a system? 
that's not working. I guess from my perspective, it's uh, going back to who we are, you know, exercising traditional laws, you know, because uh, for me, there can no, there can, there cannot be any true, true law that descends from creator. Those, that's who we are. We follow the laws that are d descended down from our creator, mm -hmm. and that's what we have to live by, and that's what we have to abide by. Whereas in the federal and provincial systems, those are man-made laws, you know, and they're open to change at the whim of somebody else. Somebody else says, uh, says uh, adjudicates a, a trial in a certain way, then, then that becomes a precedent, and next thing you know, it becomes law. In our, in our laws, we're only human beings. We cannot change laws that are descended from the Creator. So to me, that's the difference. And that's why I say we need to go back to who we are and create that balance between us and all of creation and Creator. How, come, how do we do that, though? I mean, lots of people say we need to get back to those, and it's not working. It's, we, we haven't managed to get people's ears to, to, and hearts to want to go that way. What, how do we do it? I'm not certain if you're very familiar with uh, our territory in Treaty 3. We still, we still uh, adhere to who we are. We still practice our traditional ways. Mm -hmm. And we are, uh, we are a law-making uh, nation. We make our own laws. You know, we have that capacity. So, so we're still doing that. We're like right now, we have a, a resource law, mm -hmm. you know, natural resources. We also have child welfare law. And we're working on a health law, and uh, but we still have overrepresentation in jails. We still got kids in the system, you know. And it doesn't. Is this even? But, yeah. Does it work but, for? But that's what we're trying to do. We want to take that uh, responsibility away from provincial and federal governments and their agencies. Yeah. Only we can determine how how we we uh, address the situations that's out there. And through our traditional means, you know, I believe we can create that harmony within our communities, provide healing for the communities, provide healing for the offender and the victims, you know, whereas other systems are very adversarial and punitive. Well, and then it's different too when you're in an urban center, right? This, mm. You're living in that assimilated system. What do you, what's the solution? You can't get back to the traditions if you're in downtown Winnipeg, right? Like it's... Those people are well, so yeah. far removed yeah. from the traditional way. Yeah. And, I, and I just believe we, uh, we try anything. Try anything, and as soon as we have a whiff of success, reinforce it. Uh, you know, uh, people think it's such a rigid, rigid system. Uh, I know a lot of judges, and I know a lot of lawyers over the years that were very open-minded to change. And so, so if we just try it, uh, you know, if we try it and it fails, then try something else. If we try it and it looks like success, reinforce it. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, whatever center, be it Kenora, be it Prince Albert, or whatever, that, that has success, just keep pushing it forward. And, and, and changing the justice system really does start with conversations like this and, com and ideas from people that, that are in the system and out of the system. Mm -hmm. uh, in the short term, if you're a First Nations person and you have any interest in law or law enforcement or paramedic or anything like that, throw your name in there and, and become part of, uh, of the change because yeah. people change around you uh, when you're working. Well, you had said that. Yeah, when that you, you saw some of the change around yeah. you. I think I'm already, am I running out of time? Okay, well, I want to thank you guys both for, well, thank you. for joining me. And I'm very curious to follow back up with you after the center gets up and going. Are we out of time? We have about 20 I, seconds. I just wanted to, <laughs> there was a, we, at our meeting last week, we had service providers come in to share their stories of horror. Mm -hmm. There was one situation where, where a woman threw her cell phone at somebody. And cops called on, called the, they called the cops on her. And they arrested her, mm -hmm. and she spent nine months in the Kenora jail on remand. For throwing a phone. And she lost her, her children. To oh. CFS, of course. Yeah. That's the kind of situation that, uh, that needs to be dealt with. I agree. It, sh it shouldn't happen. 
in this we modern, keep, we modern day. We keep complaining about it on this show. Yeah. And we're not going to stop complaining until we start finding solutions. That's all the time we have today. Thank you as we joined, uh, thanks for joining us as we discussed crime and justice reform. Thanks to Ernie and Francis for joining us to share their perspectives. And to our viewers and listeners, thank you for joining us. We will see you back here next week. I'm Melissa Ridgen. Have a great afternoon.